everyone. Welcome to another episode of Hosting Art. Hosting Art is supported by both the Yes Book Project and the Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics at Boston College. I'm Diana Boros, Professor of Political Theory at St. Mary's College in Maryland, and I'm here today with Grant Kester. Grant is Professor of Art History at UC San Diego and has written many books on the topic of social art practices. He is also the founding editor of Field, a journal of socially engaged art criticism. And I'm so happy to have him here today uh, to discuss all sorts of things, the value of social practice art, the role of collaboration in such approaches, and uh, inevitably the ever-present global capitalist culture that gave rise to and continues to both challenge and inspire these practices. So thank you, Grant, so much for being here. I'm really so happy. I've been reading your books for a long time. Uh, I first came to your books when I was writing my dissertation some years ago now. So uh, I have some of your books here with me today. I do not have all of them, but I have I have some, and I just want to share them with everyone. So this is, is this your first book, Grant? Yes, that's the first in the anthology, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Art, Activism, and op Oppositionality, Essays from After Image. Um, and then this book here was really was really influential to me um, when I was working on my dissertation. It's called Conversation Pieces, Community and Communication in Modern Art. I highly recommend. Um, another one sort of along similar lines called The One in the Many, Contemporary Collaborative Art in a Global Context. Um, and then I do have your latest work here, Grant. Um, this was uh, this was just published this year, The Sovereign Self, Aesthetic Autonomy from the Enlightenment to the Avant-Garde. And I should note that this is a sort of two-part uh, publication because the second text, I believe called Beyond the Sovereign Self, right? We'll yeah. be coming out uh, in just a matter of weeks in January, 2024. So that will be, um, that will be the latest um, to hit the airwaves. So thank you, Grant. I just wanted to share some of those. And I have I have all these books marked up because it's, I've been wait, waited a long time to ask you some of these questions that I've had <laughs> um, from reading these books. Um, so I guess maybe, you know, maybe the best place to start is to sort of bring up to me, I've always been interested in, as I know you have in your work from the very beginning, in sort of the links between art, the public, community, politics, um, all the different ways in which they interact. And in reading your books and in thinking about, and, and some of these, you know, I was looking back through your books and they were published some years ago now, right? 15, 20 years ago, making claims that are extremely valid today, could have been written today. Ones I refer to in particular is the sort of discussion that you bring up, and I'm thinking specifically of these two, um, but I think in the one in the many as well, but talking about sort of the role of, of markets, market systems, global capitalism, in making this type of art practice, um, social art practice, important. Um, so you, you are the art historian. And so I will defer to you in sort of explicating exactly the roots of social practice art theory. But the way I understand it is that in the United States, at least, um, it has significant roots in the, the practices in the 60s and the 70s that brought about sort of performance-based art, um, conceptual art, the happenings, right, the famous happenings that sort of started to give way to then, at least by the 90s, sort of community-based art practices, Right. And so to me, and I'd like to hear what you have to think, uh, the way I've always thought about it is that socially engaged art began to really take root in the 1990s, but theorists really weren't talking about it. And it didn't really, I, I think social practice art, I don't believe the term was even coined until the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's like the, the art was was happening. This was clearly happening, but it wasn't um, it didn't really no one, no one was really talking about it until now or until some years ago and now as well. Um and I think it's really, when I think about socially engaged art, first of all, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about is all these converging terms, right? We hear about, and there's so many more, but social practice art, socially engaged art, the social turn in art, activist art, a term that you use um, frequently, a community-based art, dialogical art, um, and there's so many more. I'm not, you know, I won't go on, but essentially a, a form of art that many have argued is less movement than approach, right? Where the medium or the tool of art becomes the interaction between people um, rather than any sort of object-based art. 
And so this is all goes back to my original question, right? When an artist is creating a traditional work of art, they are creating some type of commodity form, right? Some type of object that you can then interact with um, and then can be bought and sold. So these types of practices like conceptual art and the happenings, et cetera, before it prevent that from happening, right? It's him to like consciously go around that possibility um, to sort of not interact with capitalism in that way. I wonder what you think um, in sort of a twofold question. In socially engaged art, do you, well, first of all, do you believe that that these practices were sort of get directly given rise to because of those um, those systems in place and specifically the capitalist culture? Um, is that one sort of main reason why social practice art, community art, whatever you want to uh, call it, sort of came to be? I'll let you answer that for a minute and I'll hold my second part. Okay. Um I th for sure, that's part of it. I mean, if you just read uh, what some of the uh, artists associated with conceptualism were saying, and the, the other word for that that you'll find used in um, art historical studies is the period of dematerialization, which is the movement away from a physical and physically embodied artwork of some kind. And that's a term that uh, Lucy Lepard and, and also uh, a critic in Argentina, um, Oscar Masoda, coined. This is in the late 60s now. And in the Argentinian context, it's very much linked to uh, the intersection between art practice and political protest, a little less so in the U.S., um, but for sure, if you listen to, you know, look at the early writings of Alan Capro and others, there is a, a concern that the generation that preceded them, you know, and for, for Capro, that would have been kind of the, the painters of the abstract expressionist school and so on, that, that they, they were the the previous generation of really well-known artists had these profound, many of them had these profound leftist uh, sentiments. Uh, Barnett Newman, there's a famous interview he does in 62 where uh, he says, uh, Harold Rosenberg asked me to explain why my paint, what meaning my paintings have. And this is like Barnett Newman, flat areas of color on canvas. He said, my answer was that if he and others could read and read them properly, it would mean the end of all state capitalism and totalitarianism, right? So, so there was a sense that the previous generation they were very politically committed. This is this is the challenge of talking about political art. Like all art, almost all modernist art claims in one way or the other to be political and engaged. But for Newman and that generation, they they were so. Um, worried about their work being appropriated into things like socialist realism, which was their youth, right? The 1930s, we have to avoid having our work absorbed into the deforming mechanisms of, of leftist communist party-based politics. And so we have to withdraw into a safe space where the work cannot be corrupted. But then Capro's generation comes along and they say, yeah, but that didn't keep your work from being used as advertising backdrops for fashion shoots like Jackson Pollock's, you know, Lavender Mist and so on. Famously, it was like a Vogue photo shoot. I, shoot, I think it's Lavender Mist. I can't remember. And so then, all right, the pendulum swings back. Well, we have to get out of the art world and not just the market, but the art world as such and, and, and free ourselves and engage in some way more directly with life outside the institutional art world. And so that's that's a big piece of it. Now, you know, what happens, of course, is it doesn't take long at all before the ephemera of conceptual art, uh, you know, uh, uh, Donald Kosuth installations with these, you know, low quality Art at Povera kind of installations of a picture of a shoe become extremely valuable. So the work gets monetized quite quickly. But I think the original impulse in part was, you're right, was a kind of a to a challenge the market system in some way or bypass it. Yeah, the, thank you. It's really interesting. You know, I'm thinking it's, I believe it's in, in the sovereign self, you, you make the argument, correct me if I'm wrong, which I thought was really important and fascinating, that this goes way, way further than the mid 20th century, that there's, there's, you know, you sort of trace it way back to the earliest thrusts of industrialism. And there was like the, 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 you know, the first feelings that there was a very, very significant shift happening that yes, it was going to be economic, but that was also going to be political, social, emotional, spiritual, right. And mm -hmm. that, and that there was immediately this feeling among at least a key group of, of philosophers um, 
that that, that their art was going to play a really sort of particular and important role in maintaining that the, the connection between humans, that this newfound sort of market economy was, was, you know, along traditional Marxian analysis was going to be dividing people, right? It was going to be creating that alienation, that estrangement, and that art could play a, a key role in, in sort of correcting for that, in aiding in that, in that problem. And I thought that was really, thought that was really interesting because so often when you hear about the discussion of, you know, political art or, or not even political art, but art sort of in response to uh, capitalist forces, this is a modern conversation, right? We're talking about advanced industrial capitalism, right? We're talking about sort of um, the sort of post uh, post New Deal capitalism, um, but you took it all the way back, and I think that's that's really interesting and important to sort of connect those ties um, across time. You know, I'm thinking too I, of the I'm thinking of the Frankfurt School theorists when I think about it, sort of uh, neo Marxian analysis of advanced capitalism, and they were really concerned with what you were just talking about, right? The idea that in general, I mean, they were not just concerned; they were convinced that. Um, that market capitalism, cultural capitalism specifically, right, um, because they saw that as the greatest threat. They didn't see sort of capitalism as an economic system per se, but rather as like a cultural system, and that that would subsume sort of any any creations, any very very quickly, very rapidly, more and more rapidly, um, mm -hmm. according to those theories. We're really sort of in bad shape now, right? Because that was <laughs> these were written decades ago. Um, yeah. and you know, you read those theorists and you're like, wow, what would they be saying about 2023? This is really not good. You know, we've gone so much further down the path of the advertising everywhere, commodification everywhere. It's, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but anyway, so so you talk about in your work. And I think what's really one of the things that's really interesting about socially engaged art is that it attempt, it attempts to bypass that. Right. It doesn't create the traditional art object or, or maybe it does but it's usually besides the point if it does it's not the sort of the the meat of the project rather it creates um a moment an experience a process a series of experiences um and it may create some kind of you know sort of actual object or creation but it's the process that went into it that matters um and hence why and i know you talk about this in your work and I hear this constantly from people. Well, you know, when I bring up a certain project, wait, but that doesn't seem like art at all. I mean, that's just that's just a so that's just a political project. That sounds like a you know NGO or something, right? Um, well, how is it art? And and then it goes the other way too. Well, okay, so then you've just convinced me that it's art. Well, then what? How is it having this sort of political value. And so I don't know. And and some theorists have gone totally against even trying to you know, find that, suss that difference out. They just say, you know what, it doesn't, I'm thinking of, for example, um, uh, Nato Thompson's work in Living as Form, if, you, if you're familiar, he actually says at the beginning of the book, he's like, I'm going to present all these projects to you and you're going to be, you're going to wonder whether they're sort of art or political project. And I don't really care. I'm not really going to sort of answer that for you. I'm just going to say, this is happening. They're being made. There's more and more of them being made. They're important you think about it for yourself. So I wonder where that, where that sits with you sort of, do you feel, do you feel like you, you, you can, you can separate that you can make sort of a, a claim as to how art and politics come together in these types of works. Yeah. You know, that's a, I've heard the same <laughs> concern for decades about this work in various forms. I started writing about art in the early eighties. So, uh, before there was even a lot of the terminology didn't really exist then and you'd still hear versions of that uh, complaint and then it's gotten more sophisticated but it, it's for sure there and I think part of where that comes from just as a sidebar is part of it's just people people don't they're not always comfortable with things that look different than they expect them to look yeah. uh, and but there's also within the mainstream art world there's been a a fairly persistent drive to try to define what makes uh, advanced art advanced um, by juxtaposing it with some other practice that claims art status but has failed. It's what they it's what they call in theology like an apophatic argument about God's existence. It's an argument based on what God is and <laughs> not what God is. Art doesn't have positive attributes, but I can tell you that this is art because it's not like that thing over there. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, you know, different, that was Clement Greenberg's notion of kitsch, which is this incredibly crude, reductive notion of popular culture, all the way up to very recent debates about ethics and aesthetics and the rest. So, yeah, that's a long standing uh, issue. There's a, for me, there's a, there's a couple of things maybe I can say about that. One, there's an, an incident, I think I might reference that in one of the two new books, there's a group, uh, it was involved in um, a group of uh, De Arte Calajero, which is a group of street artists, is the name of this collective in Argentina. They were involved with the Escrache actions uh, that developed in the uh, 2000s to try to bring uh, the criminals of the, of the junta who disappeared tens of thousands of Argentinians in the 1970s to justice because there was a kind of an amnesia in Argentinian society setting in where these people were being unquestionably absorbed back into the fabric of civil society. And GAC, Grupo, et cetera, there, many different groups became active and they were, there were artist groups, there were activist groups, various kinds, and there was lots of interaction between them. So things got complex and for me, interesting. They get interesting when they're complex like that. Well, GAC was making their work, and it's a graphic-based practice. Um, and uh, they were invited, I want to say around 2000, I could have the date wrong, but I think it was around 2003. They were invited to exhibit at the Venice Biennale. And um, they, as a collective, they sat down and said, no, no thanks. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> we don't write. We don't want it. Now, exhibit, and we don't want to be part of that machine. And there's a tendency to assume that that the only things that count as art are the things that the institutional art world say says count as art. And so for a lot for some historians and critics, they would look at the GAC decision and say, well, that's when the work stopped being art, because the only way it could become art in a way was to be in incorporated into the discursive and institutional systems of the institutional art world where it might be used to register certain critiques about the imminent constraints of art world ideology, whatever, for an art audience. But once they said no to that invitation, it stopped being art. For me, that's the point at which artists said, you know, we actually have the ability to, to redefine the ontology of what art is. It's what our practice is, it is literally experimenting with the nature of art. And so for me, that's why I learn a lot from practice uh, about what art is. I, I, the fact that the projects I write about were all made by artists who called the work art is in a way meaningful. So uh, in a sense, there's more to be said, but in a sense, I'll say part of the reason I wrote the last two books is because I wanted to understand what does it mean to call this work art, other than to just say, I think it's important and it should get valued as art. That's not a very compelling reason. So I wanted to see if there are not resources within the history of art and the history of the aesthetic that can help us understand this work and its interstitial relationship to form, because that, that dialogical confusion, border crossing between what is art and what is activism is the productive part for me. That's important. That happens in any number of fulcrum, historical fulcrum points. Look at the art produced in the 1920s in the Soviet Union, the workers' theater movement, and Piscator's work in Germany. There's all sorts of moments where those boundaries get crossed in, in mutually enriching ways. Yeah. Uh, and, and then after that moment passes, the, the, the walls are, re, the cordon sanitaire is re-erected around what art is. And so I'm especially interested in those moments where art's meaning, its quality is renegotiated. So anyway, that's just, a, I don't want to belabor that too much, but, yeah. but that's one way I kind of think through those issues. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. Essentially, perpetually expanding the definition of art. Right. Because, it, you know, I mean, I've always felt as as a theorist that it's like the scary moment in the writing when I'm I'm now to define art. Right? So it's always it's sort of like this anxiety moment, because to me, it's what art is, is that is that it is sort of constantly shifting. And to some extent, sort of like you just said, which I believe is what you were saying, that at the end of the day, if the artist presents it to be art, the artist says, like, this is my creation and I, I am see it as art. Right. And I'm putting this forward in that way. Then that is sort of that's important in and of itself, right? That should be sort of taken as such. What I think that the, what I hear a lot is that sort of mm -hmm. those on the other side, right? The political, but the political scientists are like, 
Well, but they created a food bank. Food banks are, you know, ostensibly political organizations. And there's actually one right down the road that doesn't claim to be art. How come this one's art? Right. Um, and so because there are sort of some of these socially engaged projects are directly creating services for communities. Mm -hmm. And there are at least elements of what they do that is really sort of virtually indistinguishable from a sort of something that a government would do to provide. But I, I think and I wonder what you think of this, that part of what makes that art, too, is not simply that an artist made, say, the food bank rather than a politician, but that the artist is saying I needed to make a food bank for my community. It wasn't there, right? So that to me is I think also important both politically and uh and sort of aesthetically, right? That you're you're filling a gap. You're creating something that sure theoretically a government could have created, but they have not. And these projects often um do so much for disenfranchised communities, for communities that have been pretty severely neglected by sort of traditional political a like governmental reach, right, has sort of not reached them. And so par up artists step in. So to me, even like, I guess what I'm trying to say is even the act of stepping in and saying this is needed and I'm going to create it is an, is an artistic intervention, right? Um, and so that that has helped me sort of thinking about it that way as well. Um, yeah, um, that's that's helpful. Speaking of which, I brought up terms before, and I'm I'm curious. You use the word activist art a lot when you talk about these projects, and I feel like I I come when I hear activist art from other people that are not you, it is usually meant in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. They usually mean like directly political protest art. That is how I've seen it used. You're using it, I believe, differently, and I think synonymously with socially engaged practice. Do you have a sort of, I'm curious, like what your preference is for that term or sort of how you understand it? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good, the terminology is a, a vexed question. And, and honestly, I don't kind of really like any of the terms myself, even though I use activism and socially engaged, they all have they all have wafting off of them these long tendrils of historical associations and so on that and rhetorical implications that I'm sometimes not entirely comfortable with, you know. Uh, I'll say two things. I'll say one, that the, 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 this, whatever we want to call the body of work, and, and it's very deeply rooted, you know, it, for sure the 60s and the 70s were an important period. I'll say this as a sidebar, part of why the 60s and the 70s are so important is because of the influence of things like new social movements, which start to count cross effect artistic practice. Suzanne Lacey is a great example. Suzanne Lacey comes from a background in feminist activism and starts to incorporate literally the techniques of consciousness raising, which is a form of praxis that comes out of the feminist movement into her art practice. So that and that implies a very different model of political transformation. Uh, new social movements, not to without kind of being too um, generalizing, tend to be challenging the centrality of party-based hierarchies in earlier forms of revolutionary or political change. So I think that's an important factor. And of course, there's many precedents before then. So at any rate, um, not to go on, off down the rabbit hole of that, the terminology, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is so much work that has emerged since the 1990s or so globally that we can become aware of that we couldn't have before. Mm. It was incredibly hard to do. You, I, I know about projects all over the place now because it's so much easier to learn. You don't have to spend months writing letters to people and hoping they'll respond. Uh, so there's a huge continuum of practice. There is no one term that's going to capture all of that. And I think that's OK. I think the nomenclature, the messiness of the terminology is a is a symptom. It's not yes. it's not a problem. It's a symptom of a practice in its embryonic state where it's taking different forms. And that's OK. And they're all provisional names. And I'm not I don't like any of them. I'd rather have another term. But I picked one or two and stuck with them. Uh, for whatever reason, just have it, I guess. But I think it's a reflection of the fact that this work has not gone the normal path. Like in the 80s, it was really easy. People say, oh, Christopher Jenks wrote an essay about postmodernism and architecture, and then we'll just use that to talk about art. Well, all this stuff is postmodern. It kind of worked because 
a lot of the work was pretty similar. It was in galleries and museums. It involved photo appropriation, whatever, critique the author, whatever. You could come up with these generic qualities. And that's not the case so much with engaged art practices. They run across a huge continuum. So there's an unwieldy nature to the practice that does not lend itself to the art historian's desire to kind of neatly package it up and I get to name this movement kind of a thing. It just doesn't work that way. So I'm equally dissatisfied with the terms, but I just picked <laughs> the ones I picked and I kind of stick with them. No, I I love that. You know, I'm I'm a technically, I say a political scientist, I say, because I, I don't do science. I'm a, I'm a philosopher, but within political science, the, I mean, the absolute desire is to create these sort of neatly packaged theories, right? That is sort of, that is the goal. And yeah. I, I, I can't do, you know, I can't do it. I knew from the very beginning, like this, but this is not something I do because sort of mm -hmm. everything that's ever really, really interested in me interested me is, has always been sort of conceptually fuzzy. It's always been sort of mushy. And, and I, I love that mushiness and I think it's super important. And um, I don't, you know, I would be worried if we could make powerful claims about human existence um, in sort of easy terms and, you know, a nice three sentence thesis. I, I think that would be concerning and it would be sort of missing a big part of the picture because it is, it is, I mean, we're messy, we're complex. And at the end of the day, I feel like the, the medium for socially engaged artists is, is, is people, right? Is us. Yeah. And we're complicated and messy, right? You can't neatly package us. I mean, I could give you a slew of data about what's going to happen tomorrow on election day, but it won't capture sort of yeah. the political feeling that is that is going on. It just, it never does. It can't. So I don't know. It's interesting. It also maybe not to super quick story because this one always makes me laugh, but um, years ago before she died, the philosopher, um, the Hungarian philosopher, Agnes Heller, uh, she was, she was, uh, one of my favorites, and I got the chance to meet her. And when I met her, um, she tells me the story. We were I raised the issue that I had been sort of struggling because I'm told in graduate school that I should come up with these nice little neat theories and I just can't do it and labels bother me. And she goes, mm. you know what? She said back in the 70s, she said, I hosted Foucault, Michel Foucault, right? And she said, and we're having a coffee downtown, which sounds fabulous. And I would have loved to be there. And she's like, and we're having a coffee come downtown. And she said, you know, my department wants to know, like, we want to know how to label you, you know, what are you? I mean, I'm a structuralist, like, what are you? And, and so she claims he just, he got, he gets all worked up and he goes, I am Foucault. <laughs> you know, right. And so it's sort of like, this is art. This is social engagement, right? Like leave it. All the terms are, are going to be dis right. None of the terms satisfied him. He didn't feel um, sort of happy with any of them. I don't know. I, don't, I just yeah. <laughs> made me think of that. It always makes me laugh, but I am. Foucault. But it's the, you know, art historians, it's easier as an art historian to project that kind of, of simple conceptual closure on something that happened a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. But when you're writing on what's happening here and now it's, mm -hmm. it's not, doesn't work so well. And I think it's okay, which yeah. which is what you're saying. I completely agree with that. You do your best, but. Right. Right. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, conceptual refinement in any work has value. It's what we should be striving for. But I guess I think of refinement as, as saying more, you know, um, Camus said, Camus once said that if you really try to capture reality, you, you would just have to keep talking, right? Because yeah. at every moment, reality is shifting and changing. And therefore, sort of every time you stop and you, you capture a moment, it may be true, it may be as true as you could get it, but now it's shifted again, right? And so I think that's what I hear you saying. Um, and so I think that that's really, really interesting. Um, you know, I, I will say that if I had, I sort of agree with you, all these terms seem a little like, I don't know, like they've been overthought um, and maybe none of them really work best, but I've always, um, I guess if I preferred one, I would prefer socially engaged at the very least, because it, it employs the word engagement. And, yeah. you know, and so at least I'm, I, that one has always stuck with me as the one that if I'm going to be sort of talking about the value of why these works are, um, are sort of productive for political purposes, well, they're engaging, right? They're creating some type of engagement in a social public sense, which, you know, generally speaking, I think we need more of. We need all sorts of increases. I would, in public I would agree community. with that. Yeah. Yeah. That there is that word you, you phrase you mentioned social practice. And um, I, I, I tend to associate that um, with uh, it's a term that I think and I don't haven't researched it that seems to have come out of the art world. 
And you often see it in conjunction with uh, institutionalized art world practices, curated projects and MFA programs in social practice. And it's always just my gut feeling is it's always felt like it, they're slightly scared of the idea that the work might actually do something in the world politically or offend someone or be transgressive. It feels slightly sedate and, and I don't know. And, and so um, I think I, I prefer engagement because it, like you said, at least it registers at the level of the name, uh, like a, an intentionality towards actually making some meaningful change in the world, yeah. it, you know, yeah. as opposed to just saying, well, so, well, all art is social practice. Uh, right. right. But but not all arts moves outside the art world to actually, quote unquote, engage with the real, not the real world, but the world outside the art world in a more direct manner. So, yeah, I would I would probably agree with you on that. Yeah. And I think I'm guessing that that feeling that you have, which I 100 percent agree with, is probably why you you felt um, you started using activist art, especially some years ago. Because yeah. active, same reason, right? It implies praxis. It implies that it's like actually doing something and it's not afraid to be doing something. Use the word transgressive, right? Some kind of transformative subversion, rebelliousness, something inherent in it that it's sort of trying to do. Because many of these projects would sort of try to do something that, uh, shall we say, by the status quo um, was not was not, n nobody was asking for it to happen, right? So meaning yeah. the community might have been interested in it, but it was not necessarily um, welcome across the board. I, I can give you a, a quick example of that. Oh, um, one comes to mind, I'd written about this in conversation pieces, but then there's a more recent case. There's a Rick Rittier Venezia project that he did in Cologne. This is back in the early 90s, I want to say. Okay. Um, he's an artist that does these things where he cooks pad thai and other dishes, and then people come and they're supposed to learn it's like a cultural exchange where he's cooking his the food from one of his backgrounds he's um, multiple backgrounds in terms of his his personal history but but uh, thai cuisine and people come in and eat it and that's the work and it's part of what uh the french curator nicolas borio uh, named he was a good namer <laughs> that's a good name that one stuck um relational that was yeah 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 people are interacting and stuff and um uh, artists that I've, I know quite well, Jay Coe was in Cologne at the time. And so the whole thing is this, it was advertised as this wonderful cross-cultural exchange, but it, the neighborhood was undergoing gentrification and there was, they were trying to displace a, a lot of people from their houses. So there's a large homeless population who wanted to, were like, oh, a free meal. It says free meal. Mm -hmm. And they tried to get in. And <laughs> the, of course, the gallery had this security guard that kept them out and said, no, you can't come in and eat the free food. And there was a project at the Documenta in Athens, Rashid Arain did, um, called, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was Tomorrow, Tomorrow, no, Food for Thought. And it was in the Katsia Square in Athens. And it was the same, kind of a similar idea, like, okay, it makes reference to these uh, Pakistani cultural traditions, there'll be free meals. Same thing happened, homeless people showed up. And then, and then the Documenta folks had to engineer this mechanism to kind of discreetly make sure that not too many homeless people polluted the purity of the exchange. For me, that encapsulates the tendency mm -hmm. of art world-based practices to be very comfortable operating at the symbolic level. But when the when that, that displaced symbolic gesture of conviviality comes up against an unconvivial world mm -hmm. that needs changing, then the the aesthetic autonomy and the sovereignty of the work has to get reimposed. And, and for me, engaged art practice is about being comfortable with that, with surrendering some of that sovereignty and that protective enclosure, that, that purely symbolic gestural nature. Nothing wrong with symbolic gestures, and so they, they play an important role, but it's a different approach to how art produces meaning. So I think engagement and activism capture that. Yeah, I like that's a great example. I mean, it's so, so telling because that's exactly to me, relational aesthetics, 
interest. That's one term I didn't bring up and I should have. But um, to me, and I, I think it's because I sort of cast it aside because to me, it makes reference, as you said, to the interactive and participatory nature of the art action. And certainly were I to experience one of these projects in a gallery, I think it would sort of enliven me and and yeah. interest me and maybe inspire all the things that we would want as, as political theorists, right? Maybe it would inspire empathy and, and increase dialogue and increase communication. And that's great. But yeah. all the people that are not there, right, who are in need of that and all that sort of local communities is a, is really telling to me. And to me, I feel like relational aesthetics focuses on the interaction, but does not focus on the sort of inherent need in the world for 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 aid, for services, for like a inclusivity in that participation. Right. Mm -hmm. Because and that's always tough because I have seen I'm sure you, I'm sure you've seen much, much more than me, but I've seen so many like cool, interesting projects within the walls of an institution that I yeah. just, oh, man, this is so cool. And I'm so interested and I could go home and write about it. But also, I wish like all these people outside actually were able to experience it. Right. And so um, that's why to me, like relational aesthetics always felt to me very gallery confined. Um, yeah. you know, some sort of art for the art lovers. And, um, and again, interesting and important in its own right. I mean, I, I love to experience it. But yeah, I, as you say, it's just it's, it's different. And I very much appreciate this um, engaged sort of turn in art saying, honestly, just there's a there's a real bravery and vulnerability to it, right to being like, I don't actually care what you call me or whether this is political action or whether right, it's sort of using, um, using all these different techniques, like providing free services, right? The gift in art, right? Allowing that to be, yeah. um, you know, uh, as, and and some people are like, what, well, how, how could this be art? You're giving stuff away, but it's like, well, speak going way back to the beginning, right? Well, yeah, well, nothing is given away. Welcome to capitalism. So as an artist, right, to sort of do that is already inherently subversive, right? It's yeah. against all sort of cultural and economic forces, um, which is interesting to me, right? Because capitalism teaches us a, don't give things away, right? Be the winner, be competitive, outbest the, 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 the next guy, right? And oh, if that guy didn't make it, well, that's okay. That's the way it has to be, right? For some of us to make it. And so to me, a lot of these practices too are like in very, even when they're not necessarily um, conscious of it or sort of providing that dialogue or rhetoric, they're inherently anti-capitalist, right? They're saying like, I don't care how the world functions. I'm just going to give this service. I don't care if this is the right way to go about it. I'm just going to do it. And um, often these practices are really, you know, focused on on community again and on gifting, on dialogue um, and just things that are just not supported by the capitalist sort of forces that be. And I don't mean really when I say it, I don't mean the economic system. Right. I mean, sort of the cultural manifestations of the economic system that has sort of infiltrated, um, I think, sometimes even the very way we think about, you know, what we should do in the world and how we should interact with people. Um, it's hard to sort of unlearn some of that, but I think these projects help. What, what you're referencing, and this goes back to your reference to empathy as well, um, is the prefigurative component of this work. And this is something that typically is left out of a lot of political theory, uh, as uh, especially um, you see it um, across the spectrum, but certainly in the Marxist tradition, there's some examples, or it's Bloch and people like that, but there tends to be a very pragmatic notion of what change looks like. Like the Leninist tradition is a good example of that. Political change is this utterly mercenary process. There's absolutely unforgiving hierarchies. And they're you're either with us or against us. And that's the and then you you engage in this scorched earth destruction of the system that currently exists. And then magically out of this that scorched terrain, this new person will evolve who will no longer be contaminated by greed and self-interest. But there's never been a process to, in fact, uh, Bogdanov, the, the Bolshevik that breaks, breaks with, with Lenin and, and leads the pro-occult movement says, this is one of his big disagreements. He says, if you don't start thinking about how the self is transformed, this, what he calls the soldierly influence of civil war and revolution, will take over, which is kind of what happens. And so that there's never a point at which the freedom that you were fighting for is actually going to be experienced because you maintain this rigid hierarchical control. And so prefigurative experience, that is experience where you work on, ex you literally experiment with what it means to negotiate the tensions between self and other. 
to experience empathy. Empathy, which is a term that comes out of aesthetics and Vish's work on feeling into something, right? The, the significant crossover is an early aesthetic theory around empathy as well. That, 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 that is equally as important as the tactical processes of social and political change. And so what you're describing, it reminds me of this project I write about in conversation pieces, the, the Vokenklauser uh, boat talks, where they, uh, there was a problem with uh, sex workers in, um, in Zurich uh, and not having any place to live and safe housing and so on. And they organized this boat. And I remember it really struck me that I, I met the members at a conference a long time ago and they presented it. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, got me thinking. And it was the same thing, like, is this art? Why is this art? And so on, right? And um, they organized it. And they organized these talks on Lake Zurich on this little boat among, it's not a tiny boat, it's a bigger boat with chairs <laughs> and everything, uh, among a lot of the stakeholders. And these would be people across the political spectrum people that were opposed to, you know, quite critical of sex work uh, and so on, and people that were less so, trying to pragmatically address this problem. And they had not been able to reach a consensus on that precisely because they were also identified with these public positions, sex work is evil, blah, blah, blah. And the media was always paying attention to what they said. And so in that space, like here's, a, for me, a positive autonomy. That separation from the highly charged media environment in Zurich's press around sex work, they were able to agree to the creation of these pensions or, or boarding houses for sex workers who now had a place, a safe place, a clean place to live. And that came out of that project. Now, people look at that and say, oh, that's just, you know, if I'm a if I'm a good Marxist, I'll say, well, that's just reformist. All you're doing is giving the system, you know, you're showing that that in, incremental change can be produced and that simply legitimates the ongoing domination of the capitalist structural system, et cetera, et cetera. That's the routine argument. Uh, yeah. But the argument that I make in response to that is that can happen. There's an exculpatory dimension, but also how do you think resistance begins? It begins in the consciousness of individual people. It doesn't begin because the party tells them that capitalism is evil. It begins with their lived experience of capitalism and domination and of resistance in and through both the mind and the body. It begins, and frankly, what's the aesthetic about? The aesthetic comes from, is oriented around the census communists or common sense, gemeins in whatever term you want to use in the, in the enlightenment, which is precisely our ability to tap into a form of consciousness in which we, we no longer instrumentalize each other, but treat each other with respect. That's what Schiller's entire letter on the aesthetic education of manner is about, mm -hmm. is that quality, what you're calling empathy, our ability to not simply absorb the possessive individualism of the capitalist system and project it on and everyone around us and treat them as a commodity or a product or something to control and use. And so the aesthetic is very much imbricated with that hope that we have that ability that can be nurtured. And it is not going to happen all at once. It's going to happen over time, incrementally in different sites and locales. Hopefully they'll become stitched together over time into a broader mosaic of resistance. But how else are people going to come to think critically about the world if not through these individual experiences, localized experiences of resistance and transformation? So for me, that's why a lot of these practices are aesthetic and political, right, at the same time, because in the Enlightenment, the aesthetic and the political are absolutely connected in that way. Yeah, I feel this so much, Grant, really, I can't tell you, like, every, I've been thinking exactly about this, because you, I mean, you, it's, it's so sad, it's so depressing, especially with Election Day coming up. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I have where people just doubt the value of individual change, and of sort of individual recognition of change, right? They're like, yeah, but, you know, let's get, it's not really doing anything, right? Like, that's not, and it's obviously the type of change that is going to be, to me, obviously, after what you just said, very obviously, the change that's going to happen is going to be, it's slow, sometimes it's painfully slow, right? It's it's individual sort of recognition of sort of these sort of feelings. It's a tra it's a transform transformation in the self. This is not something that you know happens um, sort of overnight or easily. And as you said, it's certainly not something that's going to happen sort of hierarchically via party via sort of institutional change. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think that's so 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 important. I think that I'm, I brought up earlier the Frankfurt School theorist, but I think of Marcuse in particular because. You know, when you read the early Marx, like Estranged Labor, his essay, I mean, that is 
it's 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 everything that later Marx is not right. He's completely yeah. interested in that type of transformative change, right? He talks about this idea of species being how this type of industrial labor actually like disconnects us from ourselves. Well, he says all sorts of things from the product of our labor, etc. But I think most importantly to this, from ourselves and from like our recognition of our humanness, like that you that capacity to sort of understand our universal humanity. And so when Marcuse sort of picks up Marx, you know, uh, almost a well, 100 years later, right? Um, he's really interested in that. And he has a big beef with Marxist aesthetics um, in the aesthetic dimension because he's like of sort of exactly that reason, right? He's like, well, you're you all the traditional conception of Marxist aesthetics is all bound up in is it proletariat art? Is it bourgeoisie art, right? Who's sort of what's who's creating and how is it being created? And not to diminish the fact that sort of social position plays a role in the creation of art, of course, and sort of all of that. But he says, he makes the point really sort of, he's quite pissed off, you know, in that book. And he's like, repeats it over and over. He's like, the aesthetic experience is fundamentally individual, like in, in and, it in and it includes everybody. And I can speak to sort of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. I just want to speak to um, how the aesthetic experience can liberate, how, how it can liberate the individual. And sort of everything you were just saying, I feel like the one word I would add to that discussion is, is the idea of liberation, because I think that's sort of part of this, like the liberate and different theorists have thought about it in different ways, but sort of the notion of um, I think some of these types of artistic experiences that we're talking about it can have at least the possibility of creating the possibility, not only for empathy, like you said, which I think is so important, but of at least a temporary liberation from sort of how we understand the world and how we engage in it and how we place ourselves in it. And I feel like that there's almost nothing more valuable than that, because then we can see, you talked about resistance, right? How are we? How is resistance going to start if there is not that sort of that that breaking that that opening, mm -hmm. right? Like every revolution starts in some kind of opening. Normally, we think about it as like some kind of institutional break, so that we can have regime change. But I think in the self, it has to do with like an opening that allows us to think about things differently. And I think I think in general, art has the capacity to do that, just generally speaking. But these projects, I think, really sort of like put that on the table, make, right? Make it like, or really put that front and center that I we're, we want to sort of create this possibility. And so, yeah, empathy, but also, also liberation for, for that individual resistance. I think that's so right. Yeah. And there's a, you know, there's an, in, with a lot of these practices, there's an inward facing component, which involves the cultivation of new forms of inner subjective experience that might have emancipatory potential when they're scaled up. There's often an outward facing dimension, uh, it, which involves linking the, the agency of that collective with direct action of various kinds, the escraches, the lava la bandera, burning the flag, protests and uh, that took place in Peru uh, around the Fujimori regime and so on. Very much like that. You have both the prefigurative, that is a, a commitment to horizontality and so on, within the practice itself uh, among particular collectives, where there's an open kind of it, it, it commitment to rethinking what's it, how do we make decisions and so on. But not in the way that devolves into stasis and, and oh, we can't do anything. But there's also always the pressure of, res of resistance that's acted out. There's a Devil Woodley has a really interesting book on um, Black uh, Black Lives Matters that just came out recently, and she talks about the convening of the of of the uh, movement for Black Lives in in Cleveland several years ago. And during the, during the conference, which was uh, groups uh, part of the uh, BLM that were from all over the country came together, and she said there were all these divisions and who. How do we make decisions? And there were conservative church people, and then there were LGBT, you know, activists, and they were all disagreeing and so on. Who's going to do this? And they were literally performing the census communists. That is, they were figuring out: can we, from all these different backgrounds and investments and beliefs, can we form a consensus of some sort? And it seemed like hopeless. So there was an incident right outside the convention center that she writes about where the pol police were trying to arrest a young black man. But it's like a teenager. I think he was like 14 or 15. And the participants in the conference see this and they come flooding out and they surround and they're like, 
Not today, it's not going to happen. They surround the police in this peaceful action. And eventually they get the, the young man's uh, mother to come and so on. And so in an instant, they go from not squabbling, but open disagreement about how are we even going to make decisions to they knew what they needed to do. And that captures for me the essential interdependence of the prefigurative and the, and the practical or the pragmatic and political change. And yes, it takes time. I mean, look, the, the fact that our Supreme Court is run by a, a, a cabal of, of extreme right wing kind of Christo fascists, the, the fact that school boards are banning books, why is that? That's because for 40 years, the right wing has been working locally, incrementally and patiently and quietly to take over the institutions of public life. Not everything looks like 1917 in St. Freaking Petersburg, right? In fact, St. Petersburg didn't happen because of Lenin or some magical event. It was preceded by decades of organized resistance in Russia that simped, that there were uh, previous events that took the form of St. Petersburg, right? So you can encounter this very catastrophic millenarian notion of what change looks like to be legitimate, which I find really disabling in a lot of ways. Anyway. Yeah, agree. No, totally agree. Disabling and, and leads to hopelessness and, and so many yes. people to check out and become even less engaged, feel more alienated, feel more estranged. And so that, you know, I 100% agree. And I think these projects can do so much in the way of just making people feel like, well, two things to what you just said. One, actually making people participate in something and sometimes just feeling included in something and participating in something, I think as humans uh, can really can feel important, can feel transformative. Um, but also that in participating, which speaks to what you were just saying a few minutes ago, I think often these projects like create a situation, a foundation where decisions happen differently, where proceed right processes are different than than the way it's done, right? Than the way you're familiar with. And maybe at the very beginning, you're like, you know, I don't know, I've never done this way, but it opens your eyes to that possibility. And I do, I really stand by that. I think, I mean, I agree with you very much that I think it's so important for individuals to have even these relatively minor moments where they just say, oh, you could do it that way too, right? That's, I mean, I, I really think that can sometimes be so, so transformative politically. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it's a recognition of, of someone else in a different way or a recognition that you can have a conversation in a different way, et cetera. And so to create experiences, I think part of, that's, I think part of my my real uh, love for some of these projects is that they just sort of do <laughs> frankly do what I what I theorize about right like go out and do it and they like create the space for someone to come in and just have this experience that they otherwise wouldn't have right um that sort of no one else in the world is is really providing and so yeah I agree with that so much and I feel like that's um also so hopeful because if you don't feel that way and you just rely on some type of sort of you know catastrophic institutional change and you wait for these this massive regime change you you may you may get nothing and you may miss the mark that type of you know small quiet change that you were describing very valuable we need to be spreading more of that but these projects are doing that i mean i think it's i think it's doing you know it's interesting you said it's it's difficult as an art historian or it's a different process to talk about work that is sort of still unveiling itself uh, versus, you know, work from 200 years ago. And so I, I wonder, I wonder what we'll all be saying, what you'll be writing about in 10 years and 20 years, right, in reference to these projects and what the world will look like in relationship to them. But but I think um, one last question before yeah. I let you go. Um, so there's there's one specific, there's so many quotes actually that I'd wanted to ask you about, but uh, but there's not enough time. Uh, so there's, I believe you, I think this is in the one and the many, but you talk about how um, activist art or socially engaged art, whatever we're going to call it, um, you, you argue that it's one of the most legitimate expressions of the aesthetic versus, right, which goes back to sort of something we talked about about 20 minutes ago, but versus, you know, all the criticism against it, that it's not actually aesthetic, right, that it's not fulfilling those traditional modernist understandings of what the aesthetic is in art. Um, but you you say it's not not just that that's not true, but that actually it's one of the, quote, most legitimate expressions of the aesthetic. And I just wonder if you could talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, that's really... Uh... And th that's what the, these two most recent books are trying to get at more fully. Mm. Uh, and, and that involves going back to the origins of the aesthetic. 
uh, before it was bifurcated into two different traditions, right? There's two trajectories. One of them is the dominant trajectory we associate with art in the art world, uh, often in conjunction with notions of an avant-garde practice. And the other is this kind of subterranean modernism. And you see elements of it in anti-colonial practices and forms of, of various, you know, uh, Damier's work and the influence of the Catholic social workers movement and French art or the anarcho-syndicalism and the, and the neo-impressionists. There's all this like subterranean stuff that usually gets left out of our history, conventional art history. I mean, Clement Greenberg was in his or Albert Barr's uh, uh, or Alfred Barr's version of modernism at MoMA was Dada doesn't even count, much less German Dada, which is the scary one that was connected to the KPD. Uh, and so I was trying to figure out if there was a where what the resources were within the early aesthetic uh, that could be used to understand this subterranean component of art practice. And so that's why, so when I use the word aesthetic, that's what I'm using it to mean. You know, it's often a placeholder for like the way something looks or it's beautiful, so it's aesthetic, but I don't mean the aesthetic is aesthesis. It means the science of sensory knowledge, but Baumgarten, you know, it goes back to Greece, obviously, but it means sensory experience. It means embodied experience. It only later gets attached to art. That really happens with, you know, Schiller to some extent and then Hegel, uh, but, but Kant's critique, you know, third critique, there's not much art in it. He talks about landscape gardens, excuse me, landscape gardens and seashells and stuff. But no, he's talking about something more profound, which is the human capacity to uh, to treat others with respect. Something as simple as that, and how we experience it through the body. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> excuse me. And so that's the that's the <clears throat> that's the reason why I find this this work connected to the aesthetic in meaningful ways because it's embodied, often performative-based practices that are precisely concerned with negotiating these tensions between the one and the many and the self and the other, and often held in tension with forms of collective action that are necessary for resistance. So you have a nested series of dialogical interrelationships that are being played out, experimented with, and so on, that are essential to political change. That, that for me are profoundly aesthetic. And so there's a prefigurative component, there's an embodied component and so on. Uh, so it's that bigger version of the aesthetic that I, when yeah. I use the word aesthetic there, that's what I'm kind of getting at. Yeah, I love that. I very much abide by that. Um, I, you know, that an idea of sort of an embodied, an, under, an embodied understanding of like sensory understanding of others. You know, I, I always come back to like, well, but isn't, I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Like, isn't that what human existence really is all about is, is sort of understanding ourselves in relation to others. I, in thinking about empathy, you can, I can never help but think about Rousseau. And I think about what, what you're, you know, talk about an embodied experience. Rousseau talks about empathy as something that is fully embodied, fully sensory, right? He talks about it being an instinct. He calls it an instinct, but mm -hmm. I, it's, it's sort of this, I mean, it's like the, the feeling you get when you, you know, you think you might throw up when you see something sort of so, so troubling, so disturbing in, in another, in another living being. And so you feel sort of sick, sick from it. And that's what he talks about as sort of the root of empathy. That's how he compassion, Pite, right? Um, is that it's this like real, it's a feeling and it completely overwhelms you. And before it even becomes anything that you process sort of reflectively, you, you know, you feel it completely. And I always feel like, every, you know, ever since, and of course he's speaking about it for totally different reasons, talking about in the con context of the development of inequalities, political inequalities, um, how that eventually sort of led us away from our empathetic natural selves to a situation in which we are able to believe that some are better than others, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. and treat them that way accordingly, right? But to me, I always, I mean, I always think of like, well, that's what art does, though. That's what good art does, right? Good art, you feel it in your whole body. You could throw up from it, or you could cry, or you think totally differently, or you become a new person, or you talk differently, or you're right. And so that sort of complete, like, overwhelming of the self. Um, I don't know, is always what I think of as like the maybe the most sort of important aspect of, of all of this, of what art can do, right, um, for us um, in ways that are tr like transformative um, ways. So, yeah, thank you. Of course. Yeah, that was, I have 
I really, we, you might have to come back another time. I think I might have to convince you to do that. We could have, we could have a part two. I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much um, for this conversation. I appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you for coming on Hosting Art. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Okay.